Okay, let's do uh, one of these first. What's the complete... Actually, you know what? Let's do it this way so it's easier to get everybody together. All right, I'm going to name out a blood type. I'm not going to mention RH yet. So I'm going to name out a blood type. And uh, if you think it's that one, just raise your hand. Okay. How many think the complete universal recipient is type A? Okay, good. Type B? All right. Type AB? Good. Type AB. So type AB is complete universal recipient. And now if we include RH, it's AB positive or negative? AB positive, good. So it's a complete universal recipient because it has all or none of the antigens. All or none of the antigens, it has all of the antigens. It has the A antigen, it has the B antigen, and it has the RH antigens. I said a way to think about them, antigens are what for the cell? I said they're, they're the name tag. So if it has an A antigen, it has, it's gonna be A. If it has B, it's gonna be B. But if it has both of them, it's gonna be A and B. Just again, another comparison. If somebody's named Adam, it'll have the A, he'll have Adam there. If his name's Bob, it'll have B. If he has both Adam and Bob, it's like first, last name, Adam and Bob. So it's both of them. Now, if it's RH, you don't say the blood type is AB RH. You say it's AB positive. Okay, so that's just a slight difference, but same exact idea. So uh, what about the antibodies for AB positive? All of them or none of them? <coughs> as none of them. That's why it's the universal recipient, because there's no haters, no antibodies. So, for example, if uh, somebody wearing the name tag Adam or A, red blood cell, it says type A, comes into that environment, it's not going to be attacked because there's no antibodies against it. Because that person has A and B, so they can't hate against half of themselves. Right? They, they, whether, um, they have, if they have A and they have B, then you can't attack the A if it comes over, or the B if it comes over. But let's go the other way now. Complete universal donor, just say it along with its RH. What is it going to be? O negative. So all the antigens or none of the antigens? None of them. So then it has all of the antibodies or none of the antibodies? All of them. Except the RH, and again, that whole RH factor, we get the RH if we are, what's the word for it? Is it? There's another word for exposed to the RH. There's sensitized to it. Okay, so if you get the RH, you have to be sensitized to it. You're not born with it. All the other antibodies against A and against B, if you have them, you are born with them. There is more research saying that maybe you're not born with it. Say maybe you eat certain foods and then they, those antigens mimic the A and the B on them, then you develop them. But we'll just stick to textbook answers and say you are born with them. Okay, so that's the difference there. So uh, transfusion-wise, O has no or all the antigens again, the O has none of them. So if it goes somewhere, let's say it goes over to type A, type A has what antibody in it? Type, type A has anti-B antibody. O comes over that's not wearing any of the hats, nothing to be hated on, so it's fine. Whether anti-A is there or anti-B is there, it's not going to be attacked at all. So you can uh, visually just draw it out and you can see it. And again, the recommendation for uh, you guys to do before the test, take all the blood types, start with A and C. Can you donate to A? Can you donate to B, to AB, to O? And do that with each of them. Then start with O and do the same thing. Right, so any questions with blood typing? Okay, so let's uh, move on to platelets here. And those cases. <coughs> In one word, we're talking about platelets. What concept in one word are we going to talk about here? Clotting, the important function of platelets. So we did a lot of talking about red blood cells. We talked about how red blood cells break down and the lifespan. And now since I said lifespan, is the lifespan of a platelet longer or shorter when compared to a red blood cell? Shorter. And you see here thrombocyte is the word for platelets. What was the red blood cell word again? Yeah, erythrocyte. Erythro just refers to red. Like if you have an area that's <coughs> arithmetous, that means it's reddish. It's a red area. So you see here how much shorter is it? It's 9 to 12 days as opposed to a red blood cell is going to be how many? Yeah, just like adding a zero on there, but adding a zero to the end of that makes it a bigger number. So 120 days or four months as we've uh, quizzed about that a couple of times. Now if you want to see why, I tried to explain to you by words. If you look at that flowchart you got today, that big page, there's two sides to it. 
One of them has that big flow chart. I recommend you print it out in color for yourself. But if you follow down from the top, hemocytoblast down to a platelet, all the way just find where there's a platelet at the bottom, and then follow that pathway, you'll see along that pathway there's a big cell. It's called a mega, what? See? Good, so you guys find it. Mega karyocyte, it's huge. So what happens to that? It's kind of like an explosion pretty much, and there's lots of little pieces, and all those little pieces become platelets. Or more appropriately, they bud off. I mentioned a marshmallow last time. Take a marshmallow, and you pull little pieces off that marshmallow, that's what platelets are. So it's one cell, and it's just little pieces budding off of it. So it's just a cytoplasm with a plasma membrane around it. So that's why it's such a shorter lifespan, as opposed to a red blood cell, which is still a whole cell that got changed. Other terms here, cytopenia, cytosis. Pinia just refers to some things in a low amount. Cytosis refers to it being in a high amount. Uh, three functions of platelets. I think we got to this slide, or uh, yeah. right down here? OK, so I think this is where we left off last time. So we're going to have chemicals. You're going to see what those are. It's going to patch up because it's involved in clotting. If there's a hole, just imagine, anytime you think about blood vessels, the best thing you should think about is think about like a garden hose and water flowing through it. So if there's a hole, we got to patch up that hole, and then we got to contract the tissue. OK, so uh, contracting tissue. I think the last thing I asked you guys is about contracting tissue. So if you have a, a blood vessel, and um, sorry, think about a so garden hose. A garden hose, or actually I'm going to use something that happened to me recently. My the plumbing under the sink, one of the hose just popped off of there, and there was a bunch of water spraying through. So what I did is I, I contracted it. Is that vasoconstriction or vasodilation as I um, squeeze it? Vasoconstriction. Why, why would you do that to a blood vessel? To what? You have to reduce the blood flow, to reduce the amount of water going through. Okay, so just keep that in mind because I'm going to tell you again, uh, I think next slide or two after. Right. There's something, I should have put this slide before it, but regardless, there's one more term. Thrombocytopoiesis. If it's a hormone, what's the ending going to be? Good. Poetin. Right. So again, remember, process, po uh, poesis, they run. So thrombocytopoiesis is the process of making what cells? Platelets. Thrombocytopoietin, or actually just called thrombopoietin, is the hormone involved in making it. Just to draw your attention again, look at that flow chart that you got, the big one I printed for you. Look at the cells. Look down the left side. You'll see a three letter abbreviation for erythropoietin. Why don't you guys to find that? Three letter abbreviation for erythropoietin. Going down the left side towards red blood cell. Yeah, it's EPO. So you see EPO on there? That's showing you that hormone is telling the stem cell, that first cell up top, to become a red blood cell. So that's erythropoietin. You will see all those abbreviations, those are all hormones that are telling the stem cell what to become. Okay. I have a question, I don't see it. Just raise your hand and ask. Okay. Hemostasis, heme again blood, stasis, what? stability, um, stopping, pretty or steady. So we want to do something to blood. We want to keep it steady. We want to keep it stable. So this whole thing is about clotting, like we said in the beginning. So once a vessel gets cut, we want to stabilize that bleeding, hemostasis. And there are three steps involved, one, two, three, versus vascular. Vascular, what is your vasculature? What are we talking about? Yeah, Vessels under that specifically, arteries and veins, it doesn't matter. Again, veins include, sorry, vessels includes both arteries and veins. So then after that we have the platelets, which are the cells, and then coagulation, which means the same thing as agglutination, which means what? Clotting. So coagulation is the same thing as agglutination, it means clotting. So uh, here's a picture in the textbook. Uh, <coughs> put a knife blade to it for whatever reason. And so there's a cut there, blood vessel injury. Vascular spasm, again, is this vasoconstriction or vasodilation right here? Constriction. And to do what to blood flow? Yeah. To slow it down or to reduce it. 
So the vascular phase involves vasoconstriction to reduce it. So just like uh, one of those pipes under the sink, water is going, I'm going to squeeze that pipe just to reduce that flow as much as I can. It's not going to stop everything. It's, uh, it took me a couple of minutes. Uh, it took me about, uh, I say, it took 10 minutes and it's still flooding. It sucked, but whatever. So I started doing that. But while I'm doing it, I had somebody else there. And that other person, what would you tell the other person to do, right? You're holding on that. Turn the water off. Yeah, go turn the water off. Right? But we, we can't completely go turn the water off because let's say, um, well, not let's say, I was renting the place. I really didn't think about where to go find it. And uh, this person had no idea. I mean, I know basement, but story aside, what could I do if I had to stay in the room and I couldn't go down to the basement and shut off the water? What, uh, what else are you going to do if, if you're holding it? And you have like other materials. What are you going to do with these materials? Yeah, well, um, the thing is, it's kind of hard to go with this analogy because you don't want to completely stop blood flow. Okay, maybe in the water you want to shut off for a while. But uh, let's say, okay, how about a hole? How about that? Let's put a hole in there. Let's have the whole thing bursting. I think I heard it. Yeah, you want to patch it. Okay, now, again, it's hard to go between plumbing and this, and maybe not a great analogy. But you want to patch up that hole. Yeah, that's, that's the next thing. Of course, obviously, you've got to go downstairs, turn the water off. you got to patch it up. So the platelets are going to come in here, and they're going to patch it up. So they're going to go, they're going to adhere, and just aggregate, aggregate in that area to come stick together. And once they're in that area, the next thing you're going to see is they're going to secrete some enzymes. And these enzymes that are there, actually before I continue, look at the timing involved. Going back to number one, I forgot to highlight this. 30 minutes, so about half an hour, the blood vessel is going to be constricted for. But here's something to note, is there's how many steps that we're going to look at here? There's three steps. It's not like this. It doesn't go step one, then that's done, step two, then that's done, then step three. It doesn't work like that. What happens is while step one's happening, the other two are happening as well too. Right? They all pretty much are going to be initiated. So while one's happening, two is happening, and three is happening during that time. One is the longest. And during one, you'll see two and three happening during those. Because as you see here, number two is 15 seconds. The other one was 30, but 30 what? A minute. So half an hour is going to be held there for so 15 seconds after the injury, this one's going to be initiated. All right, hopefully, you know, my friend just stood there watching. But 15 seconds later, I'm going to go grab something. I'm going to turn this off. But, uh, all right, let's, if you want to watch these videos, usual McGraw-Hill, just type that into Google. And what's the name of this whole big process we're studying? Hemostasis. Hemo. That water comes up pretty high pressure, by the way. I don't know if anybody had that burst. I had a puddle. All right, so it's the first result that comes up. <coughs> I'll take it off mute. Start it over. When these vessels are damaged, there are three basic mechanisms that promote hemostasis or the dominant medium. Okay, so step one is called the what phase that we're going to see here? Vascular. What's going to happen to this blood vessel? It's going to constrict, like you're going to squeeze it. Following damage, there is an immediate reflex that promotes vasoconstriction, thus diminishing blood loss. Okay, so that, that's it. Step one. How long does step one last for? Yeah, half hour, 30 minutes. So step two is named after the cells, and what's the name of that? Platelet phase. And it's going to form a plug. Exposed collagen from the damaged site would promote the platelets to adhere. And just in case you're wondering, like thinking about blood flow compared to water flow, you can't turn, you don't turn the heart off, so it's got to keep flowing, so you got to think of other solutions. So if you think about squeezing it to reduce the flow, then okay, you got to plug up that hole while it's staying squeezed to reduce that flow. 
So the next thing you're going to see here are uh, enzymes coming from the platelets. There's, these are in green because if I ask them, they're extra credit. Uh, ADP, thromboxane A2, and serotonin. These are enzymes, these are chemicals. And these chemicals are going to recruit more platelets that come to that site in order to patch it up. It's just like telling somebody to go get you know, more patches so we can plug up that hole. And so it's the first two bullet points. So you're going to see that now. When platelets adhere to the damaged vessel, they undergo degranulation and release cytoplasmic granules, which contain serotonin, a basic restrictor, and ADPs and thromboxane A2. And so these are the three that I asked you to highlight. And uh, if you need the narration for this, it's written underneath. That's what makes this a good site. So then the third one, the coagulation. And again, to coagulate or agglutinate means to do what? Yeah, to clot, clump up, both pretty much the same thing. So it's a cascade reaction. It's a series, a chain of reactions. Like if you have dominoes, you line up a bunch of dominoes in a row, one hits the next, hits the next, hits the next. But this set of dominoes is like having two start points. You put dominoes at one end, dominoes at the other end, and then they're going to start hitting each other as they come in here. And then you have another pathway that they're going to meet in the middle. So this domino hits this, 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 this. And then they hit this one, and then they hit that middle pathway, and they come together. So they start working. So you're going to see a couple of pictures here to get that visually in your mind. So there's three pathways. There's one starting at one side, one starting at the other, and then the one that they meet together. Now, uh, before you see that, there's a bunch of different proteins or factors involved in this whole cascade. And there is X, I, I, I. How many? 13. Excuse me. Into puberty again. So there are 13 of them. There's extrinsic, starting from the outside of the blood vessel. There's intrinsic, starting from the inside, and then there's the common pathway where they're going to meet. Fortunately, these names make sense. As it says, extrinsic is going to start on the outside of the blood vessel wall. The intrinsic actually starts inside the bloodstream. And then they're going to meet together in this common pathway. So they're going to converge together. So there's two ways to see this. I think actually the next textbook picture is better, but here's one of them it's showing more detail. The intrinsic pathway, extrinsic pathway, you're going to see they're going to meet down here. So intrinsic starts at XII. What number is that? Yeah, factor 12. This starts at VII. That's 7. So what's happening is 12 becomes 12A. 12A activates 11, becomes 9A, uh, sorry, 11A. 11A activates 9, etc. Same thing over here. They're going to meet at X. X would be what number? 10. So I'm not going to make you worry about these numbers here or these numbers here. But I want you to know, starting at factor 10, what's going to happen. So you're going to see that in writing coming up. And I'd rather show it to you in the next picture here. And this is the one from your textbook. It's actually much better. And it shows you, okay, there is a damage to the vessel wall right there. So they zoomed in on that. Here's the damage. So the first thing, we have the vascular phase, what's happening to the blood vessel, restricting to reduce the blood flow. Then what are these cells here that involve the clotting? Platelets, also known as thrombocytes. They're going to come up and they're going to patch that hole. Then they're going to release those chemicals, those ones that you guys highlighted, I might ask about on the mm -hmm. test, extra credit. And then you have... How many different pathways here? Three. Three. Extrinsic, intrinsic, and where do they meet? Common. So starting here, starting here, and then they have the same common pathway, and that's where the name came from, starting at factor 10. So factor 10 activates prothrombinase. That ACE means this is a what? Enzyme. So prothrombinase activates prothrombin to become thrombin. Two things here. An enzyme is named on the substance it works on. So prothrombinase will work on prothrombin. But how do you remember that prothrombin comes before thrombin? Pro, pro means before. So then thrombin is going to activate fibrinogen to become fibrin. And what part tells you fibrinogen is first? Gen, from the genesis beginning. So there's two things here, whether it's a prefix or a suffix. 
both meaning the beginning. And then that's going to find the class. Right. A couple questions here. First one is, well, why do we have to do this? Is because fibrin is active. Fibrinogen is inactive. You're going to see that in digestive system again. That gen means it's inactive. Proteins are chains of what? Of amino acids. So fibrinogen is a long chain. What happens is it gets cleaved. It gets cut. So we cut a couple of them off by thrombin. So now it's activated. So it can start clotting, and that's why you start to see these blue little lines in there. That's the fibrin that's going in there, kind of like a gauze pack to fill in that area. So what's the problem if we always have circulating fibrin and not fibrinogen? What's that? If, which one's active? Yeah, the fibrin, fibrin is active. So the whole thing is we have things shut off until we need them. And just kind of like, I guess, since I was thinking about the army, you have reserves, right? and then you activate them when you need them. So what's the problem if fibrin is always circulating, not fibrinogen? You can think of it. It will always be active, so what's the problem if it's active? Clot, I heard too much agglutination, right? You'll have blood clots, basically, consistently all over the body. So that, that's the whole point here, is you have these things, actually, I think that army will kind of horses, you have these reserves. Right? You have some working, but you have some reserves. When you need them, you activate them. If they're always active, they're always fighting, they're always doing something. You, you need them when you need them. So otherwise, you're gonna stay inactivated. Why is there a series of things? Why is it not just one step? Because it's kind of like if you took a domino, put one, and you line up in a pyramid, one hits two, those two hit another two, and it keeps going. Like you can activate a lot of things right away by having like one hits this, 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 uh, cascade, you amplify signals. Instead of just going from one to here, you're doing it over and over. One's hitting two, that one's hitting two. It just like a whole telephone things. Things will spread much quicker, so you get quicker plotting process. So this is it written in words. Uh, visual was the last slide. Again, X is what number? Ten. So make sure you know your Roman numerals, uh, prothrombinase, etc. Just written down. So I'll finish it off here. So there's the plug. The final hemostatic mechanism is coagulation. Damaged tissue releases factor 3, which with the aid of calcium ions, will activate factor 7, thus initiating the extrinsic mechanism. Factor 12, for active platelets, will activate factor 11, thus initiating the intrinsic mechanism. Okay, so extrinsic, intrinsic, what's the last pathway? Good. Both active factor 7 and active factor 11 will promote cascade reactions, eventually activating factor 10. That's on the stuff here. Active factor 10, along with factor 3, factor 5, calcium ions, and platelet thromboplasic factor, DF3, will activate for thrombin activator. Alright, so just remember calcium, because you're going to see that in a moment. You need calcium for this. For thrombin activator, That's a good type of blood clot that you would want to patch up that vessel. So this is just zooming in and showing you all these red blood cell erythrocytes stuck in there. The spider web is the fiber network. And if you want to use that whole spider web, then the spiders that are making the web are the platelets. And they're very small located on here. 
So here's a 3D image. I've mentioned this a couple times. I don't know if you guys are picking up on it yet. But when you see a 3D image, does anybody know what type of microscope is used to capture that? Good, scanning electron. So scanning electron, it's a real view. But sometimes people think it's 3D. How can you get that? But scanning electrons can get the 3D views. Okay, so clots can happen. Right? They can be good. But sometimes you don't want them to keep going because they're going to block the flow of blood. So you need to prevent them. So anticoagulants, again, anti meaning what? Against. So against clotting. Another word for them, if you're talking about medication, we say they're blood what? thinners. There's at least type of blood thinners. Heparin is one of the many types. Uh, warfarin is another one. Uh, the thing that it's kind of, I don't know, whether bad or whatnot. What substance do they get like this warfarin and um, heparin from? It's a couple of people tend to know this. It's a, it's a type of poison. Rat poison. Yeah, did you know it? Or, no. There's some, some people know this. That's actually, people told me and that's how I realized it. But uh, rat poison is pretty much the same substance they use to make blood thinners. But it's, it's, it's a small dosage, not well, it's going to kill you. Right, but uh, here's the calcium, vitamin K. Vitamin K, the way to remember that one, is actually where the word, or the, where the letter K came from, and that's from German. In German, clotting is spelled with a K. Actually, coagulation is spelled with a K in German. So that's where they came up with that letter. So you need that in order for the process. They're, just, they're used here and there. If you saw in the video, calcium was put in there. It's just used throughout the process. It just kind of like helps stimulate, gets things going uh, much better. So they're essential to blood clotting. If you're anemic or your blood's thin or you bleed a lot, I'll tell you you need uh, vitamin K. Uh, clot retraction. So platelets going to contract. They're going to pull the area together. And blood vessels are made of epithelium, epithelial cells just like your skin is epithelium. So basically you're pulling it together and giving it time to heal. So that's the whole point of the retraction of bringing it together. Just like you need to give time for your skin to heal. You put stitches on it and then the stitches would go away or you take them out. Fibrinolysis, lysis means to do what? And to break down. So eventually it needs to go away. Just like you make sometimes some uh, stitches that dissolve on their own, it's pretty much the same idea. So the fibrin will start to lyse or start to dissolve. Now, there's extra information there, I just left it. I'm not going to ask you about it. So let's just review these steps quickly. This whole process is called what? Hemostasis. There's how many steps to hemostasis? Three. The first one of them involves the blood vessel uh, blood vessel itself, so it's called the what stage? Vascular. What's going to happen to that blood vessel? Trick. And that does the what to blood flow? It's going to slow it down. It's going to reduce it. Right. Uh, is that the longest or the shortest of the three phases? Longest for about how long? Good, 30 minutes, half hour. The second phase involves the name of these cells that are doing clotting. What is it? Platelets. They form a plug there. They secrete different enzymes that you have them listed down there. And the platelets recruit more platelets and, in order to patch it up. And then finally, the main thing is the third phase. That third phase is the same word for uh, clumping up and clotting. That's the what phase? Coagulation phase. That involves how many different pathways? Three. There's intrinsic, extrinsic, and what do they meet at? Common pathway. The common pathway starts at factor number yeah, ten fingers, ten. Starts at factor ten. Factor ten takes pro, uh, activates prothrombinase. Prothrombinase, it's in the name, starts activating what? Prothrombin to thrombin. Thrombin activates fibrinogen or fibrin? Which one first? Fibrinogen to fibrin, and then does the whole clotting process. Uh, last question: important vitamin. K and important iron calcium. All right, not bad. Questions? No? Good, thanks. <laughs> not really any questions of that? No. Yeah, it was a nightmare for me in school because I had to memorize those 1300 factors and it was just crazy. So I didn't see any purpose of doing that with you guys.
<clears throat> okay. Now, this is either going to be very interesting or not interesting to you at all. I'm going to try to take those not interesting people and make it very interesting for you. That's my whole goal here. Uh, before we get into it, uh, dates. Oh, yeah. We were supposed to have the quiz today, but uh, I thought about it. And I'm still going to give it to you guys. I'm going to give it to you on uh, uh, next Monday. The reason I didn't decide today is I only had one lecture to use. So I'd rather use more material to quiz you guys on it. But I still want you to sign for lecture quiz, lecture quiz six because if you plan to come on this day, I don't want to mess that up for you. So you have your attendance uh, still for this day. So still sign it as if we took it. But we'll do the actual quiz to practice in class next week. Okay. So just want to make sure that's fine. So that that's what you're signing for today. Again, we'll do it next Monday, but or not. I'm sorry, next Tuesday. Uh, during that week we're going to have the practical it's going to be on four labs i'll remind you again in lab heart arteries veins and blood which is this week the week after that week after next week is going to be your exam for you guys on that tuesday the 17th on blood and neum and fat we just finished this packet check 19. we're starting this one so there's one more packet left which is lymphatic but both of these are coming out of chapter 22. so you have one more packet after this it's not nearly as long as uh, these first two. Then there's the quiz dates, practical, and so you have everything now up there. The reason is the syllabus got pushed ahead in one week or pushed forward because the nervous system pushed everything uh, forward one week. So any questions with the dates? Are we getting that? Okay. Chapter 22. Now, here's the part where I'm just going to try to get you guys interested is the immune system, there's a bunch of cells, it's hard to visualize, it's kind of like the nervous system. Like at first, if I told you sympathetic, parasympathetic, motor neurons, afferent, efferent, it's not as easy to visualize as your humerus, your radius, your ulna, things you have a decent idea about it. So we're going to get into these things, T cells, B cells, natural killer cells, all these different things. So why, why are these going to be important? It's because they affect your lives daily. How many people in here? have a friend or family or at least a person who's spoken to somebody that, let's say, has cancer. And for those who or don't, you do, you just don't realize it. So it's, it's very important. Now, not just cancer we're talking about here, is uh, also diseases, HIV being the big one out there, viruses, bacteria, streptococcus pyogenes, strep throat. So the better you learn this, the easier micro is going to be for you next semester. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to break it down in these videos some pretty funny ways uh, to get it across. Also, uh, interactive physiology. I'll show you that when we get to it. So first thing here, a little intro on the immune system, followed by different types of WBCs. What are WBCs? Good, because we just finished the red, and we did platelets, so all is left here is the white. White blood cells. Uh, there's different types. Look at the chart I gave you, the big flow chart. Look all the way down at the bottom. You should count there's seven cells all the way down at the bottom. But out of those seven cells, how many of them are actually white blood cells? Yeah, there's five. So we'll be talking about those. We'll see how far we get into that. What's the word for white blood cells again? Leukocytes, hence leukemia, the cancer coming from it. But that's not going to be today's lesson. Uh, lymphocytes, we won't get to that today. We'll be still in different types. Specific versus non-specific defenses, the lymphoid systems, people have lymphoma. It's going to involve <coughs> lymphoid organs. And we'll talk about removal of them, good and bad about that, and uh, specific and non-specific defenses. So I'm going to show you guys a clip here. It's like a two, three minute YouTube clip that kind of intros you to it. But before you watch it, I just want to get you guys thinking about this. There are specific defenses and there are non-specific defenses. Today is not the day we're going to go into great detail about them, but again, just an intro. A specific defense will attack something specifically. For example, the flu. Does anybody know whether there's one strain or many strains of the flu? There's many strains of the flu. There's several different, I don't know whether it's hundreds or thousands, but there's a lot. Now, what happens every year when they make the flu vaccine, is there's, they call them, I don't know, I hear this all the time, the smartest people in the world. They get together, usually in Sweden, and they decide, What's going to be the three strains out of these hundreds or thousands of strains that are going to hit the world this year? And then they make a vaccine out of it. We'll talk about vaccines another time. So they make them, and you take them. 
So what am I trying to say is there's lots of different strains. A specific defense will act on strain one, one way. Will act on strain two, another way. Strain three, etc. A non-specific defense will act on them all the same way. So here's an example. Your skin. Do you think that's a specific or a non-specific defense? Non-specific. Because whether you get bacteria or a virus or anything, once that cut happens, it's going in there. Or it's defending it the same way. Uh, you know what, I'll let you see the other ones. Pay attention to the other ones in here, and I'll ask you. You'll see them in the video. A specific defense, when we get to it, there's only really two specific ones. If you want to maybe jot it down now, we'll talk in greater detail another time. These two cells here, the T and the B cell. That's your only specific defense. And then there's different grades of it. So again, just a little intro, no great detail yet. Immunity is the word to uh, resist or fight infection. Yeah, pay attention, see what specific, uh, non-specific defenses are because when you talk about your immune system, we'll actually first to compare it. When you talk about your skeletal system, you know what it is. It's my skull, it's my ribs, it's my bones. Your muscular system, you can right away visualize that. Your immune system, it's a little bit harder. There's nothing really specific, it's everything. Your skin is part of your immune system. It's part of your cutaneous <laughs> epithelial system, your integument. So just see how everything is just kind of coming together in this video. Oops. So uh, they, they listed, uh, well before I go to the next slide, they listed other types of non-specific defense other than the skin. Did you guys get it? What's, what are other non-specific things that our body protects us with? Mucous membranes, so mucus. What? Yeah, sebaceous glands, so you're saying what in general? Sweat. 
right? So mucous membranes and sweat, those, those are two big ones as well too. Because they'll catch things and they'll uh, wash them away. So inside we have the mucus that we cough up and then there's a sweat there that's on the surface. And you're gonna get that in more detail later on. I'm just trying to give you guys a little intro to think about it. But if you wanna write these things right, as we go along, when you go back to review your notes, you're like, oh, okay, I see this, now I remember. All right, so pathogens. They mentioned this word pathogen. Pathogens are things that cause disease. Pathogens are things that cause disease. Path meaning disease. Pathology is the what of disease? Study disease. A pathologist is one who practices uh, the disease thing, studying it. Right, so uh, examples here. I left one blank because I figured you guys would guess this one the easiest. Viruses and yeah, bacteria. So we have viruses, we have bacteria, fungi. Uh, the biology joke is always they say fun people, fun guys. Uh, parasites, I'm not using it, it's overused. Uh, parasites and worms. When you get to the home screen, I'm really emphasizing it this time because it's a hard one to understand. Uh, go to immune system, and this will make it easier to understand. So you have different categories there. If you want, like as I'm showing you PowerPoint slides, you can write like what category I'm in and what video number if you want to go back and look at it because I didn't write it down. So we're pretty much today in the first one, immune system overview. Okay, so this is going to be the analogy throughout the whole entire like, process of these videos. So they compare our body to a castle with guards. So that's like, we need our defense system. And then like, you saw these things like shooting, cannonballs and stuff. Then they're going to be attacked. So those are going to be our things, as they mentioned here, that are disease causing. What's one word for disease causing organisms? Pathogens. So protection from these pathogens. We go here. So right now, uh, we, are, we are on the slide here that says pathogens, so I'm just showing you what these pathogens are. And they use a pretty uh, humorous way of getting through this. When you see this, they say this guy looks like he's constipated. To effectively defend your body, you need to know your enemy. Students say that. Pathogens can be classified according to size and where they live in the body. The largest pathogens are the multicellular organisms, such as parasitic worms. All of the others are called microorganisms because you need a microscope to see them. Next, smaller than worms are fungi and the single cell eukaryote pathogens, such as the protozoa that causes malaria, smaller still are bacteria, and the smallest of all are viruses. Click a pathogen for a close up view or click the sergeant to continue. All right, so, anyways, uh, these are your pathogens here. You have the parasites. And these are the largest. They are very long. Does anybody know like where you can find they end up in the body or how long or something like that? Digestive yeah, digestive system, even blood vessels. If you ever watch those shows, right, that's a real one there. If you ever watch those shows on TV, they make them, they say, oh, monsters that invade your body or whatever. Like that's, what's that? Yeah, monsters inside me. Those are your parasites and worms that will get in usually uh, in contaminated waters if you're swimming in them. That's where those are coming from. Uh, then we have fungi. Uh, that's what they look like here. We'll learn that more in microbiome. Protozoa. This is just a cartoon depiction of one. Bacteria. Oh yeah, the eyes. Yeah, that's usually how people uh, figure out. Looks like they have eyes, like an octopus or something looking around. Bacteria. There's lots of different shapes to bacteria. That's a real image right there. It's 3D. What microscope is that? Uh, scanning electron, good. I'm saying that because you'll use this again in micro. So scanning electron here, there's different shapes. Does anybody know what these shapes are called? Yeah, bacillus, our rods. What are other shapes you can see? Uh, cocci, the circular ones. So uh, again, you'll learn that in med micro. And then viruses, this is just a drawing here. And viruses, 
they're like protected. It's like, a, I guess they say a spaceship, and inside is the DNA or the RNA that's gonna be injected into somebody. So it makes it hard to get to, because they have this big barrier on the outside. But uh, that's vaccines and things, and uh, uh, immune stuff that are attacking the body. They attack all these little things sticking out, the glycoproteins, these antigens. That's how they work, is they attack the wall or the inside sometimes. All right, well, let's uh, go back here and move on. So we have our three lines of defense. Again, this is just an overview just to get you guys thinking about it, but in another part we'll go into more detail here. You have an outer, you have a middle, and you have an inner barrier. So again, you have three barriers. <coughs> You're going to see it in this video or in this clip. They'll talk about the castle. They'll see the moat outside the castle plus the wall is the outer barrier. The wall represents your skin. What do you think the moat, that water outside, represents? Mm -hmm. Mucus. Or if it's out here, the sweat as well, too. So let's say the outer. So it's non-specific. And they're also non-white blood cells because when you go down to the second one, once you breach that outer barrier and you're getting inside, now, okay, you have white blood cells, but they're non-specific. Again, how many white blood cells do I have you guys find? There's five white blood cells in the body. So actually four of them, four of the five are non-specific. One of them is two-thirds specific. I'll, I'll get to that. Regardless, uh, when you get to the inner barrier, there are specific white blood cells. So actually, no, I'll, get, I'll just tell you briefly right now. The ones that are specific, if you look all the way to the right of your sheet as you go down, that's the one all the way on the right, is a lymphocyte. Now, there's going to be more branches to that. The lymphocyte has three more subcategories. There are B cells, and if you look at your outline, there's what else to do? T and natural killer cells. The only ones that are specific are the T and the B lymphocytes. If you're not completely getting that right now, I mean, this is not the time to. It's just so you can jot it down so when you go back, you'll, it will make more sense. The natural killer is non-specific white blood cell. So it goes in that second category. Again, I'm just telling you this because it's an open note so you have things you know, organized. The other four are going to be the non-specific white blood cells. So before we get into the different types of white blood cells, let's go back to this here. Uh, three lines of defense. Because there was such a wide variety of pathogens, we need a corresponding breadth and depth of defense. Like the medieval castle, the immune system has three main lines of defense against the invading hordes that besiege it. Let's examine each one in the order that a pathogen would encounter them. Click the castle wall to see the first line of defense. The first line of defense consists of the surface barriers to entry, also called innate external defenses. Like the walls of the castle, the skin and mucous membranes form this barrier. Like the ropes surrounding the walls, many of the body's barriers are coated in secretions such as mucus and tears. Click a guard to see the second line of defense. The second line of defense in the castle consists of the guards who check everyone they encounter to determine if they are friend or foe. The body has similar defenses, cells and chemicals and body fluids that are always on the ready to attack and destroy anything they identify as foe. These defenses are called the innate internal defenses. Click the army to see the third line of defense. The guards can also call on the third line of defense, the army. The body's armies are called the adaptive defenses. The adaptive defenses consist of two kinds of lymphocytes, B cells and T cells. It takes time to mobilize them and train them to fight an identified enemy. The innate defenses will be described in topic three and the adaptive defenses will be described in topics four through six. Okay, so you hear these words innate and adaptive. It's another way for saying non-specific and specific. So if you look here, the outside and the middle both have the word innate in them. So innate means specific or non-specific. Non-specific. Adaptive is specific because it adapts to whatever it's attacking. So again, adaptive is specific because it adapts to what it's going to attack. 
Again, we'll talk about those in more detail later on. This is just an intro time. So let's, uh, a little intro here. <coughs> it's kind of funny, showing you an uh, analogy of the innate immunity. <laughs> See, it works if you think about it. And secretions are penetrated by an enemy. The innate internal defense mechanisms, acting as guards, step into action. As you will see in topic three, the innate defenses identify enemies by recognizing a limited number of markers unique to pathogens. When they recognize enemies, they attack immediately and often manage to eliminate the threat. When the innate defenses are overwhelmed, they secrete chemical messengers to mobilize the armies of adaptive defenses. Okay, so just to make sure that analogy got across here, uh, that mold represents what in the body? Yeah, sweat or mucus. And then the wall of the castle was the skin. So, that guy came through, that pathogen, whatever it is, pathogens are things that cause disease, bacteria, virus, fungi, parasites, all that. It's coming through, gets up here. Now here we're getting into the middle layer, this guy right here. He's another type of white blood cell, I think, M, because they picked the model site here. This is one of the other types we'll get into. So anyways, uh, he's here, and it just basically is, are you good or are you bad, friend or foe? So it'll attack every enemy the same way. Just attack them, knock them out of the game. But of course, we'll look at the specifics of that attack at another time. So now if we get into here, the adaptive, or another word for adaptive is what? The specific immunity, just another analogy. The adaptive defenses differ from innate defenses in four key ways. First, they are specific. That is, they are directed against an identified enemy. For this reason, adaptive immunity is often referred to as specific immunity. Click the sergeant to see specificity. Right, what? This is the enemy. Second, adaptive I don't immunity know what involves armies of identical clones of lymphocytes, the B cells and the T cells. Click the soldier to see B and T lymphocytes. Okay, so there's the B and the T. These are your only specific ones. What's the other type of lymphocyte? Yeah, the natural killer, the NK. Again, more detail another time. So these are going to be specific. All right, just whatever. But there's still some more here. Third, adaptive defenses have memory. This means that once they've encountered an enemy, they can recognize and more quickly defeat that same enemy if it ever invades the body again. This is why many of the illnesses of childhood, such as measles, only occur once. Click the soldier to see memory. That's the analogy there. Get old and you remember. Which is actually kind of opposite. Fourth. Because lymphocytes move throughout the body on ceaseless patrol, adaptive immunity is able to react to an invasion anywhere in the body. In other words, adaptive defenses are systemic. Okay. So, it just giving you an idea between the innate or the non-specific or the adaptive, the specific. So, leukocytes, white blood cells, defending against pathogens, you guys told me you're causing disease. Abnormal cells, these are going to be our what cells? That's the one question I had to raise your hand for. Cancer cells. Yeah, the abnormal cells are your cancer cells. So basically our immune system either is gonna attack foreign things or self things. Cancers, your own cells. So what happens if, just a little uh, thing about that cancer, if you remember the cell cycle, uh, there's that big circle and it repeats. There's a G1 phase and after the G1 phase, it's gonna run the next phase. S phase, then there's the G2 phase, then mitosis, then you keep repeating it. At each break between each phase there, there's a checkpoint. I think I mentioned this to you guys before. So if uh, something goes wrong in the checkpoint, the cell is supposed to say, okay, this is wrong, let's uh, destroy the cell and so it doesn't rep uh, keep replicating. So it doesn't uh, keep going. <coughs> it doesn't become abnormal in a lot of it. 
But what happens, and that's always happening in our body, every second, every couple of, I think even milliseconds. We're always getting mutations. But fortunately, uh, our body takes care of it. But for somebody who ends up getting cancer, that checkpoint is breached. Right? The cell gets by, and it now it has something wrong. The DNA is not twice. It's maybe two and a half, or there's something wrong in the DNA. It just goes wrong, and now that cell is out of control, and the body can't stop it. So that's an abnormal cell. I mean, there's also things where if you're out in the sun too long and the UV gets to it, it damages that DNA. That's another way, too. It's abnormal. That's going to keep growing and get your carcinomas. <coughs> now, how are cells going to get around? How are we going to get these immune cells to get to the pathogens, to get to the abnormal cells? Well, cells secrete chemicals. Secrete, I'm just going to compare it to um, perfumes or s the smells. So let's say, you know, somebody smells very bad. Right? Are you going to walk towards that person or away from that person? Uh, I heard, I heard, I didn't know what I heard, but I hope he's away. I heard a couple of things. You're going to walk away. If somebody smells good, you're going to what? Yeah, you're going to stalk them. You're going to keep walking you know, towards them, keep wherever they're going to keep going. Or if you think about food, you'll keep heading in the direction of that good smell. So that's called chemotaxis. There's chemicals that are causing some sort of tax, some sort of direction to keep going. So there's also a little quick clip on that. If you go to YouTube, I didn't put a link for you guys. If you go to YouTube, just write chemotaxis in there. And it's the first video that pops up. It says neutrophil chemotaxis. And you're going to see this needle. And from the end of the needle, they're secreting the chemicals that you can't see, but the neutrophil will just follow it. They experiment on grad students too, apparently. These human neutrophils, taken from the blood of the graduate students, are mobile cells that will quickly migrate to sites of injury to help fight infection. They are attracted there by chemical signals that are released by other cells of the immune system or by invading microbes. In this experiment, Tiny amounts of chemo tracks are released from the microcontent. The neutrophil sets these compounds, they polarize and move towards the source. When the source of the chemo tracks move, the neutrophil immediately sends out a new protrusion, and its cell body reorients towards the new location. Whistling, you see somebody smells good, right? Okay, so uh, chemotaxis is that word for it. So there's positive, then there's negative. Mainly everything's going to be positive chemotaxis because it's positively moving towards it. Negative would be it's moving away from it. So again, these are just intro words here because later on I'll say these chemicals are secreted and due to chemotaxis, it's going to move there. For example, platelets, platelet secreted chemicals. I had you uh, highlight them. The A2, the thromboxane, ADP, all those, those are positive chemotaxis because more platelets will come to those chemical signals. That's how we communicate, or cells communicate within the body from one to another. I, I just put this chart in here because now we start talking about the white blood cells. Again, how many total white blood cells? Five. Uh, here are the five now that I was asking you to see earlier. So there's five types of white blood cells, and these are the list. Neutrophils, eosinophils. I think I'll say that again. Eosinophils. The other one, try saying that one. Yeah, it's a tough one to pronounce, so I just want to get you guys to say it again. Basophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes. So those are your five types of leukocytes. Okay. Don't confuse lymphocyte with leukocyte, because which one of those is a more general term? Leukocyte, because it encompasses lymphocytes. Now, something that you're going to see individually, slide per slide per slide, is going to tell you how much of them are in the blood. Uh, what am I trying to get at? All right. If you look at a blood sample and I ask you which one of these is the greatest amount, which one of these is the least amount, that's what I'm trying to get you guys to understand right now. So you will see the information as you go from slide to slide to slide, but what I'm going to do for you is just give you an easy way to get it together here. And why am I saying that is because Here's another example of somebody will do well on the test and somebody who won't is if you get this note down because the information is there, but do you organize it or not? So the way to remember this, I and mean, again, you have your notes, but if you don't want to, just remember it. You take the first letter from 
each word here, so L, M, etc. These are in order of the amount. And so if you take the first letter, it's never, it's the most, never let monkeys eat bananas. Right? Never let monkeys eat bananas. The never, or the neutrophils, those are your greatest amount. And as you, if you look on the next slide, you'll see it says 50 to 70% of leukocytes. The lymphocytes will be the next greatest. After lymphocytes, what's the next greatest after that? That would be monocytes. And then eosinophils or basophils. Yeah, then eosinophils. And then the least amount is going to be your basophils. You normally get this once you look under a microscope enough. That, you know, we don't have that kind of time during this course. But if you do, you'll be like, oh, I always see neutrophils all over the place. Or I see basophils. This week in lab is when you look under the microscope and you're going to learn to uh, identify them. When I did this over the summer, they already took the blood lab. It was like the week before. So I'm just going to fill this in for you guys here. Now, five types of white blood cells. Here are three. So how many are left on the next slide? Two. So the first three are put into a group. We call these the granulocytes. I don't have the spelling up here, but if you spell the word granular, and at the end take the ER off and put an O instead, that's up top. Granulocytes, or granulocytes. I guess maybe is the better way to pronounce that. Granulocytes. So granular sites have granules. Why is that important? because granules are, are little specks. If you look all over at these cells here, and the more you pay attention to this part, the more it'll make the lab easier for you this week. Is when you look at these little specks, these little dots all over the place, here they're purple, here they're pink, there's a bunch of purple dots. These are granules, they are proteins. Granules, it's, I mean, it's not just there for a reason. I mean, there for nothing. It's there for a reason. There are proteins that are gonna be secreted, or substances that are gonna be secreted from these cells. So uh, the first one here are neutrophils. You'll learn how to identify that in lab. But these are neutrophils. Usually you just look at its nucleus, it has many pieces to it. Uh, the second one, B, is eosinophils. They have the pink color to them, pink granules. And the last one, uh, it rhymes with the first two is basophil. So I basically just told you the ending to all these three is what? Phil. Here's my little mnemonic I just came up with the other day. Maybe it's been used, I don't know. The granule, the granule sites or the fills are filled with granules. So maybe if you want to make that shorter, the fills are filled with granules. Is that that's just telling you basophil, eosinophil, <laughs> Neutrophil, all those are granulocytes. They have granules <coughs> in them. To see why, here's the compare and contrast. The next slide, same spelling, except there's one letter at the beginning of granulocytes that means without granules. Yeah, A granulocytes. A meaning again, without. So even though you might see these little dots and little specks, they're not the same amount as you see in the other fills. Eosino, basal, and uh, what's the third one? Eosinophil, basophil, and neutrophil. So monocytes, monocytes are the larger ones. Lymphocytes, you'll see a huge nucleus with very little cytoplasm on the outside. All this stuff you'll get in lab, you'll see it written as well too. Okay, so we have granulocytes, we have agranulocytes. The granulocytes all end in what? Again, the granulocytes end in fill. Good. I'm doing the time. All right, so we'll stop it here and we'll continue from there next time.